This morning, uh, I've entitled my message, Walking in the Light. John, the Apostle John, in his gospel, at the very beginning of his gospel, refers to Jesus as the light. And if you will, turn with me to not the gospel of John, but to 1 John, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, where it says this. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. <clears throat> Here in 1 John, the apostle talks about God being light. And he talks about how we are to walk in the light. And that if we walk in darkness, yet claim to be in the light, that we lie, not only to others, but to ourselves as well. This morning, there are three things about the light that I think are important. When I talk about the light, I'm speaking specifically about um, the light of life, Jesus. And so the first thing that we can see is that we need to know the light. We need to know the light. In Psalms 119, 105, and then verse 11, or 119, 105, and then 11, it says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against God. When I grew up and we did vacation Bible school um, a million years ago, we would uh, bring the flags in and we would march them down and there'd be two young men that would hold the flags and somebody that would hold the Bible and we would say the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States flag. We would say the Pledge to the Christian flag and then we would say the Pledge to the Bible. And uh, these verses have always stuck with me because those were the verses that we read or that we said when we said our pledge to the Bible. Um, those of you may remember it, I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Its words have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. In order to be the kind of Christian people that God has called us to be, we have to know what he expects of us. Philosophy was created in an effort to try to prove the existence of God without this book. And you can have some limited success with that. They have these different arguments, the cosmological argument that argues that from creation, creation points to a creator. And the Apostle Paul will make much the same argument in the book of Romans. He'll say, you ought to know that God exists just by looking at the universe around you. It points to a creator. There are other arguments that philosophy uses to try to prove the creation of or the existence of God. Apart from the Bible, there's the ontological argument. There's the argument of the uncaused cause. So have you ever played uh, not the game of dominoes, but played with dominoes, right? You know, the game of dominoes, you have to line up the dots and, you know, um, but 
as a child, you also may have played with dominoes. That's where you like stack them up and you like push over the first domino and it knocks the next domino over and so on and so forth. And you make these intricate designs, right? And so the domino, the first domino pushes the next domino, which pushes the next domino. And so you have this series of causes that knocks them all over, right? Well, the argument of the uncaused cause is that somewhere, no matter how many dominoes that you have, someone has to push over the first domino. That's the uncaused cause. And philosophy says that that um, uncaused cause, that pusher of the very first domino must be God, right? So you can have some success with trying to prove the existence of God without God's word. The problem is it can't tell you what God is like. You can possibly, you know, make an argument that there is this creator that's out there, but those arguments can't tell you about his character, about his nature, about what he expects. That can only happen if he reveals himself to us, and that's exactly what he did in this book. This book tells us about who God is. This book tells us what God expects of us. This book tells us how we can spend the rest of eternity with God. But unless we read this book, we won't know who he is. We won't know what he expects. In order to know the light, we have to get into this book. You know, all of us at some point in time have purchased a, an item that has those dreaded words on the outside of the box, some assembly required, right? And... <clears throat> Any, you know, self-respecting man will not look at the instructions until all other options have failed, right? The first thing that we do is we dump out the box, we look at the parts, we see if we can assemble it just by looking at the jigsaw pieces that are laying on the floor. If that fails us, step two is to see if there's a picture of the product on the box, right? And surely we can assemble that product by looking at the picture on the box. If that fails, step number three is to call a friend. <laughs> and if all else fails, then we uh, finally break out the instructions. Well, sometimes we approach Christianity the same way. And we are busy trying to live a Christian life without really knowing what's expected of us or how to do it. I remember a story about my brother from years ago. So um, Andrew has a cousin, Stephen, who they're, they're born in two different weeks, two different months, two different years, and they're less than seven days apart. So Andrew was, uh, Stephen was born at the very end of December, and, and Andrew, of course, was born on the 4th of January. And they were down, uh, David and, and Valerie were down in uh, Nashville, and they were expecting Stephen, and they had gotten this crib, and David is trying to assemble the crib, right? And so Valerie decides that it would be this really wonderful thing to help him assemble the crib if she gave him one of his Christmas presents early. And David's like not wanting any part of that. So here she is chasing him with this uh, electric screwdriver, right, that she was going to give him for Christmas. He is trying to not see it because he doesn't want to see what his Christmas present is, and their apartment kind of had this circle, 
right? And so she is chasing him with it, and he is like, no, no, don't want to see it, right? Going around the circle, so she thought she was going to be real tricky, and she lays it down as she chases him around the circle so that he'll see it as he comes around the next pass, and he averts his eyes so he won't see this, you know, electric screwdriver. This is crazy, some of the stuff that we do, isn't it? But um, in order to know the light... We have to be, we have to read God's word. We internalize it, and then the Holy Spirit is able to use what we have read to encourage us as we live our life for Jesus Christ. No mechanic or carpenter can ever have enough tools, there's always more tools to buy. And, um, When we study God's word, it's like we're putting tools in the Holy Spirit's toolbox that allow him to encourage us, to convict us, to enlighten us, so that we can be more like Jesus every single day. This morning, down in Sunday school class, um, we were talking briefly about angels, and we were in the book of Revelation, we were in the book of Daniel, we were in the book of Acts. But if you don't know about those other stories, then they can't help you as you're trying to understand things that are in the book of Revelation. Do you follow me? And so it's important that we know the light. The second thing that we need to do is we need to show the light. We need to show the light. In Matthew 5, 14 through 16, it says this. You are the light of the world. Like a city on a mountain, glowing in the night for all to see. Don't hide your light under a basket. Instead, put it on a stand and let it shine for all. In the same way... Let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will do what? Praise you? Or do what? Praise your heavenly Father. So when they see our good deeds, the purpose is not to praise us, but that people will praise God. In our world today, is it hard to find people who are interested in only themselves? Is it hard to find people who are interested in um, helping others only if it helps themselves? No, it isn't. Because that is the nature of people without God. You know, I look around me and I look at all that God has made and I look at the complexity of the body, the human body and all of the things and, and the inner working of things in our, in our world and It astounds me that people can think that that happened by chance. That somehow, you know, uh, that old saying that if you have an unlimited amount of monkeys typing on an unlimited amount of typewriters given an unlimited amount of time that they will eventually produce all of the great works of literature. I don't care how many monkeys you have, it will never happen. Right? And it's like that as I look at our world and I see the complexity of it and say, I don't care how much time you have, how many possible chances that you have, it's not going to happen. 
How many times would you have to throw a deck of cards up into the air to have them land in a perfect pile? You don't have enough time in your lifetime, right? Statistically, it could possibly happen, but it will never happen in your lifetime. But people choose to believe that. Why? They choose to believe it because if you acknowledge that there is a God, then you have a responsibility to do what he asks. It's easier to say, there is no God, and I am only responsible for me, than it is to acknowledge that there's a God and to live for him. As far as I'm concerned, it takes far more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. But Jesus in Matthew here said that We're to live our life in such a way that when people look at us, they are drawn to God. That they glorify our Father who is in heaven. Do we do that by living like the rest of the world? No. We do that by being different. We do that by being like Him. In a world that is concerned only about itself, it is Jesus that teaches us to be concerned and to love others. It is Jesus that teaches us to love our enemies and to pray for those that hurt us. It is Jesus that tells us to be holy because he's holy. If we live just like the rest of the world, then what in the world is there going to be to draw people to Jesus? We need to show the light. We need to be living, breathing examples of who Jesus is. Do you ever wonder why when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, he just doesn't just take us straight to heaven? That'd be great, wouldn't it? I mean, accept Jesus, no more pain, no more suffering, no more bad stuff, right? Get to go straight to heaven. It doesn't work that way. Why? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Because God's plan... For saving the world involves people telling other people about Jesus. And there is no plan B. But that gets to my final point, so I don't want to steal my thunder there. But the other part of that is this. God intends to judge the world by you. What do I mean by that? How many of us would say that we read this book as often as we ought to? I'm not seeing a whole lot of hands out there, right? If we who are as Christian people who claim to wear the name of Christ don't read this book as often as we ought to, how often do you think non-Christian people pick up this book? only when their world is completely falling apart. So how does God intend to judge the world by this book if people don't read it? I'll tell you how. He expects his people to be a living, breathing example of what is in this book. When The world stands before him in judgment, and everyone who has ever stood on this planet will give an accounting for their life. When they stand before him in judgment, God intends to be able to say, you knew what I expected because you saw my people. 
they gave you a living, breathing example of what I expected. Are we living our life in that way? Are we living our life so that God could say on the day of judgment, George, you knew what I expected because you saw Dan Peterson at work and in the community. That's what God intends. It's a big responsibility, isn't it? The Apostle Paul was able to say, follow my example even as I follow the example of Jesus Christ. Paul was showing the light. He's saying, you want to see what Jesus is like? Look at me. I'm an imperfect example of what Jesus calls me to be. We need to show the light. And then finally, we need to throw the light. We need to throw the light. In John 1, 1 through 14, it says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So wherever you see Word there, think Jesus, right? So in the beginning was Jesus. Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him, and nothing was made without him. In him there was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered it. There is a man named John, John the Baptist, who was sent by God, he came to tell people the truth about the light so that through him all people could hear about the light and believe. John was not the light, but he came to tell people the truth about the light. The true light that gives light to all was coming into the world. The word was in the world, and the world was made by him, but the world did not know him. He came to the world that was his own, but his own people did not accept him. But all who did accept him and believe in him, he gave the right to become children of God. They did not become his children in any human way, by any human parents or human desire. They were born of God. The word became human and lived among us, And we saw his glory, the glory that belongs to the only Son of the Father, and he was full of grace and truth. The Apostle Paul says there in John 1 that Jesus was the light of the world. We're not only called to know the light, to know of Jesus, to know about him, to know what God's word says. We're not only called to show the light, to be examples to the rest of the world of what God has called us to be, but we are called to share the light, to throw the light to others so that they also can become sons and daughters of God. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, right before Jesus leaves, he gives his church, his disciples, these marching orders. He says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus has told his his disciples to go and make disciples. Teaching them to observe all of the things he has commanded 
It's not a request. It's our job. It's why we're still here. Part of the reason we're still here is to be a witness to the world around us. But the other part is to make disciples for Jesus Christ. To share with them the good news of Jesus. In Romans, and I don't have uh, slides for this. The Apostle Paul writes and he says this. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. It says, How shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed. In other words, how shall they call upon God when they don't know about him? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. The Apostle Paul there writes and says, how are people going to know about God unless somebody tells them? And how is somebody going to tell them unless somebody goes to proclaim that message? And how are they going to proclaim that message unless they're sent? Well, In Matthew 28, Jesus does the sending. He tells us to share the good news of Jesus to all who will listen. When we have really good news, we want to share it. We want others to share in our joy. But when it comes to Christianity, we're afraid to share because we're afraid that they won't be as excited about it as we are. If I had the money, and I don't, but um, I, if I did, I had the money to give a million dollars to every single person that asked me. All you had to do was come up to me and say, Dan, I'd like that million dollars that you're offering. And I would give you $100, I don't know how many $100 bills it take to make a million, a lot probably, right? That was the only requirement. But you could only get it once. Would you tell your friends where they could get a million dollars? Or would you say, nope, I got my million, nobody else gets any? You'd want to share that with everybody who would listen. And if you went up to somebody that you cared about and you said, you know what, if you go up to Dan and you ask him nicely, he will give you a million dollars in cash. And they said to you, you know what? You're an idiot. (laughs) You big dummy. How could that possibly ever happen? And you would say, fine, whatever. And you would take your million dollars and put it in Farmer State Bank. Right? Would it matter what they said when you knew that you were right? No. So why does it hurt so much when somebody isn't interested in Jesus? You see, they're not really rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. It's not on you. In Corinthians, Paul writes, because um, what's been going on is that some people in the church are saying, I belong to Paul. Others are saying, I belong to Apollos. And Paul says, some of you are saying that I'm of Paul. And others are saying, I'm of Apollos. And he says... I didn't save you from your sins. Apollos didn't die for you. It was Jesus. And he says, I watered, or I planted, and Apollos watered, but it was God who gave the increase. It's our job to share the message, 
And it's the Holy Spirit's job to get those people to the baptistry, not ours. We have to know the light. We have to show the light. And we have to throw the light. We have to share the love of Jesus to all who will listen.